If I asked you what it takes to be a successful fly angler, what would your response be? If I asked you to boil down all of the tips and techniques and skills and all the articles and podcasts and videos you've read and break that down into, let's say, five tips, what would be the ones that you would share? Are you going to hit casting? Uh, Are you going to talk about how you need to have a, a PhD level understanding of bugs or you need to be able to read the water like a book? You know, I gave this question a lot of thought, and that's what we're going to talk about on today's episode of Untangled. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Company. Howdy, folks. Welcome to it. This is Untangled, and I am your host, Spencer Durant, and you are listening to the most exciting thing to happen to fly fishing since the invention of the Wait For Fly Line. Yes, we do think that highly of ourselves here at VFC. Okay, I think that highly of myself. I'm not going to speak for the rest of the team members, but (laughs) no, I'm kidding. This is a lot of fun, though, here at the show, and I'm stoked that you're tuning in. Whether this is your 44th episode you've listened to or your first, we are happy that you're here, and We're just going to have some fun. That's what this show's about, just having some fun and learning some fly fishing stuff. Speaking of fly fishing stuff that we are going to learn, on today's show, we are going to cover float tubes, how to pick fly rods for saltwater fishing, ultralight fly rods, so we're kind of heavy on the fly rods this week, how to get more success as a beginning angler, and how long do flies and fly tying supplies last. So a pretty good mix of topics. I think we're going to have a lot of fun with it, just like we do every week. And without further ado, we are going to jump right on into the short questions. If you are new to the show, I try to answer a couple questions at the beginning of each episode that they they may not require a, a super in-depth answer, but they're still good questions that we need to cover And if you ever have a question that you would like answered on the show, there's always a link in the podcast description. You can click that link, fill the form out, send your question on in, and I will get to it. I am working through a bit of a backlog on questions right now, so bear with me. I'm getting through them as quick as I can, though. So your questions will get answered if you send something on in. All right, enough of that housekeeping stuff. Our first short question, Peyton from Washington, writes in and says... First off, love the podcast. I've learned so much. Keep it up, please. My question is about float tubes. I've never used one, mostly fish little streams and wade rivers, but I am thinking about getting a float tube for the high mountain lakes I sometimes hike to, or even lowland lakes and ponds just to just access more water. So I went to the fly shop and looked and noticed there are donut float tubes and U-shaped ones as well. What type would you recommend and maybe better brands and models? Thanks and tight lines, bro. Peyton, thank you for the question. I really do appreciate that. And hopefully I get to keep this show up. Uh, as long as as long as long I get questions, I'll keep the show up. So there, there's your impetus to continue submitting questions for the show. And this is the, this is like the second question we've had recently about flow tubes. I didn't realize they were this popular. I, I used to flow tube a lot. I just don't as much anymore because I got fat and it hurts my back. So I'm trying to not get fat so that it won't hurt my back so I can float tube again because I really do miss float tubing. It's just a lot of fun. Anyways, I, I, I think the U-shaped float tubes are a lot more comfortable. You just seem seem to be a little bit less squished. And those donut ones, it's like you're wearing a giant floaty. Uh, it's just a really weird sensation, and I wasn't a big fan of it. I really do like the U-shaped ones more. As far as models go and brands, they're all really similar. I've used a few different ones, and I haven't noticed a huge discrepancy in quality. You might if if you go for like a, I don't even know how, how much they are these days. I haven't, I haven't looked at float tube prices in a while. But I'm sure you'll notice a big price, a big discrepancy in quality between price points. But find something to fit your budget, and you should be fine. I've had mine for 
oh, about a decade now, I think, and it's still going strong. So and, and as, as I have mentioned on this show before, I am not the kindest to my gear. So it, it, it's lasted me very well for, for that long. And it, it wasn't, I think 10 years ago, it was probably a $200 tube. I don't know what that would be in 2023 money, but, you know, inflation's all, getting all of us these days, isn't it? Anyways, hopefully that answers your question there, Peyton. Get the U-shaped one and just find one that fits your budget, and you should be in great shape. All right, our next short question. Brian from Maryland writes in, and he says, I live here on the Chesapeake Bay, which is salt water, but there's also great freshwater fishing within a few hours' drive. If Cinch House, which I understand is a military acronym, uh, commander-in-chief of the house, and Brian puts in parentheses, i.e. my wife, has limited me to one rod. Which one should I get to get started in both? Is the 9-foot 5-weight rod sturdy enough for chasing redfish or specks on the flats? Is a 7-weight rod too much for fishing rivers? Love the podcast, and thanks for taking the time to share this sport with the world. P.S. Coke Zero all day long. Brian, you're 100% right about the Coke Zero, and for any new listeners... I've had a long-running uh, uh, desire to get Coke to sponsor, to get Coca-Cola to sponsor Untangled. So if any of you happen to have an in with the advertising execs at Coca-Cola, please let me know. Because I drink more Diet Coke than anybody else, and Coke Zero is the best. I know Brian says that, or not Coke Zero is the best. I can't believe I just said that on the air. Alex is going to kill me. Diet Coke is the best. Coke Zero is inferior to Diet Coke. And I drink more Diet Coke than anybody I know, which probably isn't something to brag about, but that's why we need the sponsorship money so I can start saving some coin. So Coca-Cola, this is an opportunity for you. (laughs) Well, anyways, Brian, your question's kind of tough. It's really hard to find that rod that is going to have the crossover in performance from freshwater and saltwater specifically because you are changing so much in fly size and fish size between the two that it's it's really tough to ask a five weight to do everything for redfish. Most guys I know that fish reds use eight and nine weights. I don't know of anybody using smaller rods than that. If you fish redfish consistently and use lighter rods, please let us know. I'd love to hear about it. The guides I know are chasing them with eights and nines, though. Those are going to be way too much for trout fishing. So that's the issue that you run into. A nine, an eight and a nine weight could even be overkill for bass. A seven weight for bass is, yeah, that that's a bit much. Six weight's kind of your sweet spot for a lot of bass fishing. Seven can do a lot of really great things for bass fishing, though. So a seven weight might help. But I don't know that I'd want a seven weight out on the salt chasing redfish. And the seven weight is still going to be too much rod for trout fishing. So if that's what you're chasing, you're you're kind of, you really are stuck between two things. I, I think you really do need two fly rods. A six weight is going to be too light for most saltwater stuff, but it's going to be your most versatile freshwater rod. I would say take whatever your budget is and split it in half and buy one five weight and then buy your eight weight for the salt water stuff. I think that would serve you the best. All righty, folks, those are the short questions for the show. Now we are going to jump into the main part of this week's program. Our first question on the show comes to us. Jacob from Colorado writes in and says, Hey there, love the show. Keep it up. My question is on one and two weight fly rods. Have you used one and when does it make sense to? Does the feel of fishing with a one weight feel that much better when fishing tiny mountain creek fish that are only four to ten inches? Or does it make sense to stick with a three weight and not go below that? Thanks, Jacob. This is a fun question here. I really like to get the the chance to talk about the ultralight fly rods. I was really enamored with them probably, oh, three or four years ago, I think. 
I really got interested into the ultralight fly rods. It was, it wasn't quite to my wing level of obsession where I literally just think about wings, which speaking of wings, I had some last night. It was wonderful. (laughs) Anyways, I own a few different ultralight fly rods. Uh, I've got a one weight and a two weight and they're a lot of fun, but really at the end of the day, the one weight especially is pretty gimmicky. The two weight that I have, it's a six and a half foot two weight. And it's actually fairly, for a two weight, it's fairly versatile. And when I say that, when you go down in line size, you're limiting what you can fish with. Because in fly fishing, we don't cast the fly, we cast the line, which has the fly attached to it. And some flies are just too much fly for that light of line. For example, I wouldn't fish a size four sex dungeon on my two weight because that two weight is just not going to have the backbone. It's not going to have the power to turn that big streamer over and actually present it well. And then you run into the problem of if you hook into a really big fish on these ultralight rods, what do you do in that instance? And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But when I when I talk about them being gimmicky, it, it really is you have to have the perfect conditions to actually use these really, really light fly rods, the one and the two weight specifically. I've even handled Sage for a while. They made a triple zero weight fly rod, and I don't know why it, it was the line, triple zero weight fly lines like angel hair for crying out loud. It's insane. I'm sure it was really great for bluegill maybe but i don't know that you could actually make a dry fly cast with one of those that line is so fine and so so light but you also mentioned and i want to i want to get into this too you also mentioned three weights in your question and i was having this discussion with a buddy of mine a couple weeks ago we were talking about ultralight rods and i told him I, if I had to pick between a two and a three weight, I think I would honestly pick the two weight because three weights are really just disappointing to me. I'm not a fan of three weight rods because you pick a three weight up and it feels in your hand. It feels like it should be able to do everything that a four weight does, but it doesn't. It doesn't have the backbone for your larger dry dropper rigs like a four weight. It's not as good in the wind like a four weight. It's not as good with nymph rigs as a four weight, but a two weight, you pick a two weight up and you don't expect it to do any of those things. And I think that's why I like the two weight so much. It feels, feels more honest to me. It feels like a, a real honest rod. And I'm sure I'm, I'm going to get a, a lot of folks telling me that they disagree with me here. And that's fine. Something that I've tried to make very clear from day one on this show I'm answering questions and giving my opinion, not because I think I am right on everything and the way that I fish is the only way to fish. I'm giving all this information out so that you can then go ahead and use it to have the fishing experience that you want. That's one of the magic things about fly fishing is we really can make it into whatever experience we want it to be, and it can be our own thing. And for me personally, I just don't like the use of three weights very much. It is interesting, though. You say something like that and folks start to take it a little personally. So don't take it personally. I'm not, if you love your three weight, by all means, I am happy that you love your three weight. I'm just not a big fan of them. You also bring up feel in your question here. And I, I want I want to get on that it, f- Feel is really subjective. When I do my fly rod reviews, that's the hardest thing for me to put into words. How does this rod feel? What does it make me feel when I'm casting? Usually I compare it to other modern rods. This rod feels like a Sage. This rod feels like Winston. They have distinct actions that you pick them up. And if you've, if you've been in fly fishing long enough, you can almost tell what a rod is. Someone could hand you one blindfolded you would cast it and say, ooh, that's got a very Winston feel to it, or oh, that feels like a sage. So the feel is so subjective that I'm not going to tell you if I think it's better or not. You will certainly feel the fight of a 10-inch fish more on a one weight 
than you would on a three weight. But again, it's not up to me to say that it's better, but you, you do feel that, that fight more. This does bring up an interesting question, though, when we talk about ultralight fly rods, and I'm excluding Euronymphing, where two weights are very common. Uh, we're just talking about the rods that we would use for traditional Western trout fishing. Again, the use cases for the one and two weight rods are really small. I mentioned this earlier, but in it really boils down to when could you actually use these rods and are they going to be just a gimmick? Yes, they would be great on small mountain streams, but how small do you need to go? Well, I've got a couple of one weights that I've, I don't think I've fished them more than five times because they're, they're so, they're so ineffective unless the conditions are perfect. You can't have too much wind. The The one weight is so light and soft that if there's too much wind or you're using a larger fly, like a size 10 hopper, for example, that one weight is going to struggle. And I live here in Wyoming where it's always windy. So I almost never have good conditions for my one weights. My two weights a little bit different. I don't feel like the two weights as gimmicky of a rod. You do need very ideal conditions to use the two weight, but it doesn't feel as as gimmicky to me and i'm not sure why i I really thought about this and wondered i was like where 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 can i put my finger on this and make it make sense as to why it doesn't feel like this and i i think it boils back down to that little six and a half foot two weight i mentioned earlier i've actually used that during trico hatches before and it's really wonderfully effective because it lays those bugs down. And trichos are a very tiny mayfly, for those who don't know. But it lays those bugs down so soft. It's so hard to beat how well you can present a little trico with a two-weight. The catch, though, like with the one-weight, is it can't be windy. If it's windy, all, all bets are off of that two-weight. And it it is tough because when you hook a large fish on a two-weight, what do you do in that situation? I actually hooked a, I, I caught a 20 inch brown on my two weight once. I remember this and I will never do that again because I tired that fish out so much trying to get it into the net. Uh, now I'm not saying that, I'm not saying you shouldn't ever you should never try to fish with a two weight because you might catch a fish that's too big for it. But I'm I'm just saying there is such a thing as too little rod for too much fish. You don't want to be in that situation because you don't want to needlessly stress the fish if you don't have to. So all in all, I if, if you want to use the ultralight rods, I would go with a two weight. I think that's your ideal. The one weight, I wouldn't really even mess with that unless you've got unless you've got like a five foot wide creek that's full of ten inch fish and very little wind. Then your one weight's going to be perfect. Other than that, I think your two weight is really going to set you up well. Honestly, though, I really don't fish. I, I fish my four the most. With my light rods, I, I really don't fish below a four very often. And I've got plenty of small streams here here in Wyoming. I, I just like the solidity and the backbone of the four. It feels like like more of a proper fly rod. And again, that goes back to my, my personal preferences on this as well. I certainly don't want to discourage you from trying them, but that, that's what I'd recommend for you. So hopefully that answers your questions, Jacob. I really do appreciate you taking the time write that and send it on in thank you harrison from pennsylvania writes in and says hello i just recently started watching your channel and i love your content what is your recommendation to get more success as a beginner well harrison thank you a ton and (laughs) i don't think you understand uh how much you just stepped into it (laughs) with that question because this question, it's a short question, right? But it actually spawned a very long answer in my mind. So hopefully y'all can bear with me through this. This is the 
the topic that I, I teased in the hook of the episode where I, I really sat down and I thought about just answering this as a short question at the beginning of the show and giving a few quick tips and then moving on. But the more that I thought about it, I realized that I would, I would be able to give the listeners to this show, I'd be able to give you the most value if I dug into this question a little bit. And as I mentioned earlier, I did come up with five things that I think every beginning angler needs to know if they really want to be successful out on the water. I, I, took, I took a long time this, this last week writing the show, putting it together. I really I distilled everything that we've been working on with beginners lately. We've been doing a lot of beginner-focused stuff here at VFC. That, that's our bread and butter, really. But we've been working on our beginning fly fishing master class. So I, I thought through that and I thought through my experiences with creating content that really is going to help the beginners. We're, we're not just trying to create content that, that makes you buy our flies. That, that's great and we love that you buy our flies, but we really do want to create content that's helpful, right? So I went through that and I, I thought to myself, What are the things that are the most important? If we strip all the other stuff away, because we talk about a lot in fly fishing. I mean, we just talked about float tubes and ultralight fly rods. As a beginner, do you need to know that stuff to to put a a trout in the net? No, you don't. I'll be honest. There's a lot of what goes on in fly fishing discourse that at the end of the day doesn't make a hill of beans difference for the beginner to being successful. That's what's so cool about fly fishing, though, is you can go so in-depth and so into the weeds on this stuff. It's a lifetime of learning that you are never going to complete. Uh, the best anglers I know feel that way about it. They they are anglers who always go into a day of fishing expecting to learn something or see something or experience something new to them. So uh, any, anyways, I, I could go off on that for, for a long time. <laughs> I've got my five tips. I think this is what every beginner needs. So write these down, bookmark the podcast so you can come back to these. But this is the stuff that I truly believe if you just focus on doing these five things, this is what's going to help you find that success as a beginner and help you stay with this sport in the long term. So number one, success is not only measured by the fish that you catch. This sounds like a cliche, and it is a bit, but it's also very true. If you go out on the river and you you judge your success solely by the fish that you catch, you will never be happy. You're always going to miss fish. There's always going to be bigger fish that you didn't catch. There's always going to be something. Your rainbow trout wasn't pretty enough. The brown trout didn't have a big enough kipe on it or whatever it is. There's always going to be something about the fish that disappoint you if you make them the ultimate goal of your time out on the water. And catching fish is part of it. It's called fishing, right? (laughs) It's not called standing in a river waving a stick. It feels like what we do a lot of the times, but that's not the name of the sport. The sport is fishing. We want to catch fish. But I've had days on the water where I've only caught one or two fish, and I'd consider those incredibly successful fish days. Heck, it's a success just to be out on the water and not stuck behind a desk or something. The fact that you're on the water in and of itself, that's a success that you shouldn't write off because you are out there doing what few other people do. I know it feels like our rivers are crowded and they are, but in the grand scheme of things, there's only only something like four to five million fly anglers in the United States. So you're doing something unique and interesting and outside the mainstream. That's worth celebrating in and of itself. That's that's a success. You're doing something new. You're learning. That's never a bad time out on the water. It, it is frustrating when you get out and you don't catch fish, but you do need to learn to appreciate the entire experience and you will always have a good time. And, and speaking of this, there were... There were multiple times, oh, probably probably six, seven years ago, and I don't think I've even told Alex and Berkeley, the, the other guys here at VFC, about this, but 
I threatened to quit fly fishing because I'd had such a tough time out on this river with some buddies of mine. We we went out there, and I got my butt kicked. It was really technical dry fly fishing, stuff that I love doing, but my buddies fish circles around me, and I just could not get a fish in the net. It didn't matter what I did. I couldn't even get him to look at my flies. So I threatened. I, I was done. I was, I was going to sell. I was going to go home. I was going to sell all my stuff, invest the money in the stock market, get a real job, and you know, be boring for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm really glad I never did it, but that was also when my focus was I need to go catch 20, 30 fish in a day for it to be a success. The fish are part of it. The fish are a ton of fun, but they are not the end-all, be-all. I think that's very important for beginners to understand, appreciate the journey, enjoy it. You don't get to be a new angler ever again. This is your first time at it. So enjoy the heck out of it. I was thinking about this the other day. I was remembering how I was just out of high school. I was living in my grandma's basement. And I had a Camaro and I fished five, six nights a week. And I was so deliriously happy during that time. All my other buddies were dating or off to parties or whatever. I was fishing until it was too dark to see anymore. And then I'd keep fishing after that anyways. It was so much fun. And I got my butt kicked by the fish those days. But I wouldn't trade those days for anything. They were so fun. My fishing now is a ton of fun, but it's different. And you'll understand what I mean the more and more that you do this. But I, I'm spending so much time on this point because it matters. It's something that I want you to understand. All right, I'll, I'll move on. Tip number two, good casting will make or break your ability to catch fish. If you can't get your fly to the fish, how do you expect to be able to catch that fish? Fly casting, it, it can be tough to learn, but it's really easy to refine once you get the hang of it. If you need to, spend some time practicing your cast in the park. I taught my best friend to fly cast that way, and guess what? He just spent a week in Alaska with me bombing 60-foot cast to big old grayling. I, I was really proud of how good his casts are, and I taught him how to cast in a, in a city park in Colorado. So if that works for my buddy, it'll work for you. Practice your casting. You don't need to be a champion caster, but you need to be able to get your flies to where they need to go. If you want to catch fish, that's critical. All right. Tip number three, you absolutely need to be able to identify likely places that trout are going to hang out. One of the most common questions that I hear from beginners is, where do I fish? And usually they're asking about, well, what river do I go to or what specific stretch of river? The question that they really should be asking, though, is what type of water should I be looking for right now? Where are the fish right now? That's something you learn as the seasons progress and as you progress as an angler. But as a beginner, you got no clue. Where are the fish? I don't, I don't know. In the river somewhere, right? <laughs> you, you need to know how to identify water that looks fishy. Learning what a seam is specifically. Seams are like the crack cocaine of the fishing world. There's always, okay, that's probably a really bad metaphor. And this is probably going to get flagged on YouTube and Spotify. So YouTube censors, I'm not promoting drug use. Let me come up with a different metaphor. Uh, it, it's like the pizza. Everybody likes pizza, right? Nobody doesn't like pizza. Every trout loves a seam, just like every red-blooded American loves pizza. Or any, a, every person on this planet loves pizza, all right? Trout love seams. You need to be able to identify them. They are really important. They are, they're not always obvious, like a deep run or a pool or even a riffle, but you will be infinitely more successful as an angler when you can look at a piece of water and know where the fish are going to be. We actually have an entire series over on the VFC blog that is dedicated to learning how to read water, and it walks you through the entire process of recognizing water and where the fish are likely to hold 
We also have episodes on this topic coming up in the beginning fly fishing masterclass on YouTube. So you're going to want to stay tuned for those. I will put the link in the description for the blog post though. So you can peruse those now. And like I said, stay subscribed to the podcast so you can, or pardon me to the beginning fly fishing masterclass on YouTube. So you don't miss those videos. All right. Tip number four, you do not have to be an expert on flies. I think this might come as a shock to some folks, especially given what we, what a lot of us read in the fly fishing world. But uh, let me give you an example here. Last week I saw uh, Todd Tanner. He wrote a piece in Hatch Magazine about 10 commandments for beginning trout anglers. And I, I know Todd, he's a heck of an angler. He's a really great writer. One of his commandments that he listed is, that you don't need to know your bugs. And I really like how he phrased it. So I'm going to, I'm going to quote him here. He said, you don't need to know the Latin name of every insect in the river. You don't even need to know their common names, but you should be able to tell a mayfly from a stonefly, from a caddis, from a midge, and you should have a reasonably good feel for their life cycles and their basic characteristics. And when the trout tend to focus on them, I couldn't have said it better, Todd. I 100% agree with you. You do not need to be this expert who has a PhD in entomology. You do not need to be able to tell the different species of blue-winged dollars apart, but you do need a firm grasp of what flies are hatching and when. Knowing this eliminates the ever-popular what fly are they hitting on question that plagues forums and Facebook groups and fly shops the world over. Learning about flies is pretty easy though it seems intimidating but it's not that hard we actually have an entire ebook dedicated to picking the right fly i've linked that in the podcast description it's free so it, cost is not an issue it's literally free go download it that will help you don't have to be an expert in flies but you do need to have a, a basic knowledge so don't don't feel like you need to go buy the bug book and memorize everything because you don't that's it's helpful and it's great, and you could spend your whole life learning about bugs, but you don't need to. All right, and tip number five, presentation is everything. High school basketball coach always said, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. He's 100% right, especially when it comes to fly fishing. He was talking about, you know, when you meet girls, you don't want to come off like a complete idiot, but I, I'm going to take his words to fly fishing instead. <laughs> And I'm going to tell a, a quick story here to illustrate this as well. I was, I was in Boy Scouts. We did that growing up a lot. And my scout leader, Chad, he and I were, and, and the, all the rest of the scouts, we were down on this mountain in Utah. We were fishing, and we found this little stream, me and a couple of the other scouts. We found this little stream, and it was chock full of a bunch of big cutthroat. And... We were just beside ourselves. We couldn't believe it because we could get them to come out and chase our worms. I didn't have any of my fly fishing stuff with me on that trip, so I was just using worms on a spinning rod. And we would get these fish to come out, and they'd look at the worm, and they'd even chase it downstream. But then they'd see something they didn't like, and they would turn around and go back to their little hidey holes. And we could not figure out why in the heck we couldn't catch those fish. So... We trudge back up to this lake by this little stream and we come back empty handed and Chad's like, hey, where's uh, where, where's dinner? Because you guys are supposed to catch fish. And we told him, we can't, we can't, we don't know what we're doing. So Chad, he looks at our tackle, he looks at our gear and I remember he just looks at me and he's like, Spencer, you really think this is going to catch a fish? And I said, of course. He said, no, this is awful. I, my knot was terrible. The worm wasn't on the hook right. In short, the presentation was awful. So Chad showed us how to tie clean knots. He showed us how to put the worm on the hook. He took us down to the river. He showed us how to put it in a place where the fish were going to eat it. And as soon as, he did those, as soon as he did those things, what do you think happened? Yeah, that's right. We caught dinner. We caught a whole bunch of fish. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But... That lesson has stayed with me all these years later in that presentation really is everything. I think this is the part that probably takes the most practice out of any of these tips. 
because a good presentation is always going to change based on the day and the river that you're fishing. It's it's never going to be the same day to day. Yes, you always need drag or you always want to eliminate drag, but where you stand and how you do it, it's going to change. So that's what makes this this the tougher thing to learn, but it is 100% the uh, the most uh, rewarding, I think. And I, if, I just want you all to remember, if your presentation is bad, it does not matter how perfectly your fly matches what's out there on the water. You're probably going to be out of luck if you cannot present it properly. So those are our five tips. Hopefully you guys found some value in that. I think that hits the mark. But if you have something you would add to those five tips, let us know. Let us know in the comments. Shoot me an email. Uh, carrier pigeons know where to reach me. You just tell them it's that Durant guy in Wyoming and, and they'll show up on my doorstep. But hopefully, Harrison, that answers your question as well. Thank you for taking the time to write and send that one on in to us. This is our last question for the show, but definitely don't go anywhere because story time is coming up right after we answer Steve from Montana's question. Steve writes in and says, Good day, Spencer. I recently bought some flies at a local garage sale. As I was going through my newly found plethora of about 200 flies to pinch down the barbs, check for rusty hooks, and look for damage to the flies, I noticed on, excuse me, I noticed on a few flies what appeared to be very small bug exoskeletons or perhaps just dead bug carcasses. Not a lot, but I did notice around four or five. Anyway, it caused the question to pop into my head. Do flies and fly tying materials made of natural or organic materials have a shelf life for several years and, oh, sorry, I have a shelf life or expire after a period of time? I do have some tie, some fly tying materials that I have had for several years, and it seems that when I pull open the storage drawer, I get a funky smell. Is it best to rotate through flies and fly tying materials every few years? Do you have any tips for storing flies and fly tying materials to help them last? Thanks. Steve, this is a really great question. Thanks for sending this in. Short answer is no, natural materials don't really have a shelf life. It all depends on how you store them. I have some saddle hackles and capes from the early 90s that my dad and grandpa were still tying with back in those days, and I still use these myself. They've been stored well, so they didn't have any insect damage. And speaking of insect damage, I did some digging on this subject because I wasn't 100% sure, and I found some great information from Barry Ord Clark. He is the feather bender on YouTube. If you've ever seen his videos, does excellent work. His advice was to store natural materials like feathers in an airtight container and out of the light. If you do that, you should be able to prevent bugs from getting into your feathers and your fur. I, that's what I've done with my hackles, and that's why they've lasted me so long. Uh, the smell that you're describing when you open the drawer is probably just a musty feather smell. My feathers all smell kind of weird. I think feathers in general from a chicken are going to smell kind of weird. I know my chickens smell kind of weird as well. So uh, it hasn't impacted their durability or performance in any way for my flies and for my feathers. I'd just say, again, make sure that you store them in that airtight container and you're going to be in business. I don't think you need to rotate through your flies every few years. That's really excessive. And unless the hooks have rusted or they're falling apart, you're going to be fine. I've got flies that my grandpa tied that he did in the 80s and they're still fine they're ornamental but the fact remains that all the stuff should last a good long time like it has for me it's just got to store things correctly so uh and with that in mind if you are in need of fly tying materials we do have fly tying packs you can check them out uh i'll put a link to those in the podcast description so Hopefully that answers your question there, Steve. Thank you again for sending it in. And it is now time for what we all look forward to the most every single week. It is story time with Spencer. All 
I think it was about a week ago, maybe maybe two weeks now, I was out on my local stream here in Wyoming. I was fishing through this stretch, and if you've got a local stream and you fish it often, you, you have certain stretches that you sort of revert to, that you, that you always go fish, that you're always interested in and in checking out how the fish are doing on them, and I've got one such stream like that and a few different sections. So I parked my truck, I get out, and it had been a long day at work. Not a bad day, just long, and I needed to reset and kind of be in a better mood before I go home. I, I try not to bring frustrations home with me from work. And I go, I fish through a little bit of the river, and I caught like three fish, which was really, really low for the river through there. I can usually catch a few more than that. And I was catching them in weird spots. They weren't at all where they belonged. They were just kind of hiding out in the marginal water. There weren't really any trout in the in the good water like you would expect them to be. So it was really kind of a head scratcher. And this little stretch of river's got three really good runs, and then there's a, a nice place you can scramble up the bank, get out, and walk back to the truck. So I got to that last run, and I was ready to just scramble up and get out. But but something happened because the water, the, this little stream, it's a freestone, but there's a dam really high up on it that it controls for irrigation, and they had just shut irrigation off on it finally. So the river was down to a very easily wadeable level. It's a very steep little stream, and it can be tough to wade when the water's high. And I always end on this particular run when I fish this stretch because there's a waterfall that's so steep that you can't really get around it when the water's high. The water wasn't high. So I looked up and I thought, huh, that looks like really good water behind that waterfall. And then I looked at my watch, and I was like, eh, I'm just going to go home. I'll get some pizza on the way home, and I'll be okay. And I was like, no, the water is great. The weather is perfect. I'm going to go up there above it. I'm going to bust myself out of my rut, like we talked about on a recent episode of this show. I'm going to kick myself out of my rut, and I'm going to go explore. Well, I am so glad that I went exploring, because I get up above that waterfall, and there are runs up there that look they're just beautiful. They're perfect. There are these perfect little pools. And I ended up catching like a dozen fish out of this new water that I'd never fished through before, including the biggest rainbow trout I've ever caught from this creek. And I've lived here for how long now? In, in this part of Wyoming, I've lived for a year and change. So I, I fished the river you know, pr pretty thoroughly. And I'd never caught a rainbow this big. I couldn't believe it. There was even one little spot where I got into, and the, there was this really, really deep pool, but there was a fast current going through the middle of it, and I had to throw my flies up really far upstream so they'd have enough time to sink before they got to this spot. And the current pushed them to underneath a rock that I was standing on, and there was an undercut underneath the rock, and I just saw this little flash, and this big rainbow came out and took my stonefly nymph, and I set the hook, and this rainbow jumped like five times. And meanwhile, I'm in this, I, I think the stream's maybe 20 feet wide at that point, so I'm trying to not get my rod tangled in the trees, and I'm trying to wrestle this fish. It was, it was just so much fun. I was grinning like a schoolboy. It was wonderful. It was the best night I think I've ever had on that stream all because I didn't go home when I got to the end of my usual run I actually kicked myself out of my rut and I had one of the best evenings I've ever had so it's just a little reminder to not get stuck doing the same things go out there enjoy it explore because you never know what you're going to run into all right folks that does it for us on this week's episode of untangled I appreciate you taking the time to listen to the show. As always, it means a lot to us when you are able to rate and subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it, Spotify, Apple, the Carrier Pigeon Network, even via the Pony Express. Uh, wherever you're listening to the show, please rate and review. Five stars is uh, totally appropriate for this show, so please do that. Make sure you're subscribed as well, and remember... 
If you have any question that you would like answered about fly fishing, there is always a link to send those questions into the show in the podcast description. All right, until next week, everybody, tie lines. Tie lines.